Okay. I think we should get this going since we have a limited time and we have lots to cover. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name is Ritika Subhash. I am the director with a company called Mangahai. I'm also a children's book author and I'm a mother to a feisty four and a half year old. Today we are going to talk about how to build higher order thinking skills during the vacation period, which is sort of almost looming uh, around. And uh, as parents, we really, really try hard to make the best of the vacations. But how can we ensure that during this period of one, one and a half month, uh, our children don't lose the connection with learning? Um, and I'll come to that part of higher order, order thinking and what it means first um, to set the stage for the rest of the talk. So um, if any of you are into education, you would have heard about Bloom's taxonomy, which talks about the various levels of um, uh, understanding and learning that happen with, uh, within a, a, a child's brain. It starts with remembering. Um, this would be mostly facts, memorizing, recalling things that they have seen or experienced. Next comes understanding. So understanding is when I've read something, um, you know, I can recall it and I can explain it in my own words, in my own way. The next level is application. What I have seen and what I have talked about, how can I apply it into my day to day life? So, so that's the third level after remembering and um, understanding. The fourth level is analyzing. So if I have um, you know, information about something, can I use some mathematical models and do some calculations to analyze um, and find out if this is relevant for me, if this is relevant for the, you know, for the problem at hand? So that is the uh, skill of analyzing. The next skill is evaluating. Whatever is my analysis, is that something which is relevant? And is that something which I can change or is that something that I can work upon is the skill of critic critiquing and judging and that's called evaluation. And the final level is creation. Now, this is, I think, the, the what you call the um, the most topmost point of, you know, being at the critical thinking summit, uh, which is if I have gone through all these levels of understanding, can I create something of my own? Can I create a solution to a problem? Um, and essentially, that is what we are looking to raise in our children, right? We want children who are creators, who are producers of knowledge and not just consumers. So if you look at the first one or two levels, which is uh, uh, you know remembering and understanding, these um, are skills of a consumer, where we are consuming content either through uh, a book or TV show or anything, anything around us, the stimuli around us. And then um, we, we try to recall facts and we try to understand and, and, and you know, apply those. Those are lower order thinking skills. Mm -hmm. And the higher order thinking skills are the evaluation bit, uh, the analyzing bit and the creating bit. Now, the truth is that you can't build a, a building um, you can't build the second floor unless you've built the first and the ground and so on and so forth. You have to have the foundation to ensure that the building is strong and uh, the same applies for critical thinking. You need skills of remembering, of memorizing, of understanding, of analyzing to be able to get to the level of creating something of your own. This entire um, spectrum, it goes from lower order thinking to higher order thinking. So your creation would be a higher order thinking skill. Now, where does this creation happen? Science tells us that in our brain, uh, the part called the frontal lobe is responsible for um, problem solving, for critical thinking, for critiquing, and for analyzing uh, and creating new things. Um, frontal lobe is also the part that gets developed the, the most, um, you can say, uh, uh, later than the rest of the brain. So it starts getting developed in the ages four to five, and it's at peak is when you use it at 11, 12, and 13. So um, that's about where that critical thinking happens. Now there's another thing that happens in the frontal lobe, which is um, your understanding of languages. 
So your broker's area, which is uh, which is a part which is uh, responsible for production of language, is actually based in the frontal lobe. Now, coming straight into how can we ensure that our children have the higher order thinking skills or the critical and problem solving skills and um, do something which is also fun and engaging and uh, appropriate for vacation time. I've actually broken it down into four major parts and you can use it across age groups. But if you want to sort of you know, progress one after the other, I would say the first is free play. And this can be used for preschoolers, for children who are in grade one, kindergarten, one, two, three. The next would be role playing. Again, it can start very early, but if you had to move in a progression, I could say grades one, two, four, and five. The next would be um, reading. Of course, reading also spans all grades. Um, and the last would be project-based work. So let's talk about each of these, the free play, the role play, um, uh, the, the reading, and the uh, project-based work, and how it enhances learning, critical thinking, as well as subject knowledge. Because at the end of the day, we are all pressure, pressurized by syllabus completion, and we want to ensure that our children are also utilizing the vacation time at the, at the most optimal level, uh, while also having fun, because this is their only time away from school, and studies and you know the rigor of a, a, a student's life so coming to free play i think um, we have really over a period of time um, done a disservice to the act of free play all of us in our generation we always think back to our childhood and say that oh we used to go out and go downstairs and play so much with our friends and it used to be so much fun but most of the play these days is very structured uh, it's either uh, structured play dates or um, it uh, boils down to, uh, you know, uh, getting the children enrolled in certain classes. So most of the time, we as parents are lugging our children from one class to the other, from art to dance to, uh, you know, a lot of those options. Um, whereas for younger children, science research has shown that free play and letting the child just be um, is essentially helping them build their cognitive skills. Um, when you let a child play with sand, with mud, or with water, they are dealing with the environment and they get to know texture, they get to know properties of things around them, which is your environmental sciences. When a child is playing with blocks, um, or if they're playing with, uh, with rocks and stones in the park, um, they're actually building their mathematical and sequential arranging skills. Um, even indoor activities, if you are doing a structured indoor activity in a play area or any such place, it's helping students build their um, uh, spatial understanding. So how, how do I take care of my own self and my body in a confined space? Um, outdoor play, obviously, uh, you know, it, there are so many facets to outdoor play, but one important aspect which we don't give a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot of uh, consideration to is the fact that when a child is playing outdoors they're also interacting with other children so their emotional skills their social skills are also getting developed they they get to learn how to deal with peer pressure they get to learn how to deal with bullying and all of that and and as much as we want to prevent our children from all of that um it is also an essential component to expose them to be able to figure their way out of such situations. So if you were to look at subject knowledge, uh, you know, like I said, uh, a free play can actually teach you science, EDS, mathematics. It can teach you geography. You can talk about plants and you can talk about types of animals and bugs and catch ladybirds. And there's, you know, the sky's the limit really to what you can do in free play. The second is role play. <clears throat> Um, again, this is a very, very um, understated activity and it would mean a lot if you as a family can do role playing every now and then because one of the core skills that it nurtures, uh, which also relates to higher order thinking is decision making, is taking ownership. So if I am doing a role play, for example, and uh, you know, just taking an example of a historical 
figure. So if I'm, for example, uh, acting like Mahatma Gandhi today. So I am also taking in and I'm soaking in whatever was the sense of environment around that time. I'm trying to understand the kind of issues that that particular character faced. And I'm trying to put myself in his or her shoes to be able to take certain decisions or, you know, act like a certain person. So those skills are also very much part of the higher order thinking skills. Um, when I'm talking about history, so for example, the empathy with historical characters is can be greatly built through role play, through acting. Um, another very important skill that gets built is if you let the child be the director. So if, for example, if there are five or six year olds, they can very well take up the responsibility of being the director of the role play and they can write the script. They can actually, uh, you know, change the ending, for example. How does it matter? They're also building their skills of, you know, creativity, which is again a critical uh, thinking skill. <clears throat> so in terms of subject knowledge, like I said, history, you can teach English and language through, through role play. You can even teach economics through role play, um, where you assign a certain situation, an economic situation to um, the child and, uh, you know, ask them to think of pros and cons of making one decision versus the other. So that's part of economics. And of course, like I said, general decision making skills through role play can be nurtured. The next is um, reading, I think, and I can't, can't, you know, really speak enough about it. Reading is a, a core skill that we need to nurture in our children for a variety of reasons, not just because we want them to speak in English and we want them to appear presentable, but the idea of expressing oneself in any language, whatever language they are comfortable with, is um, it's a hugely empowering and a hugely liberating skill to have. Of course, I talked about the broker's area, which is responsible for production of language. There's another area which is at the back of our brains. It's called the Wernicke's area. And that one is uh, responsible for processing of language. These two sort of work in tandem, the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area. <clears throat> so, um, and I, like I said, the Broca's area is also in the frontal lobe where all the critical thinking and the planning and the higher order thinking skills are, you know, nurtured. So mm -hmm. when we are empowering our children to produce language, to be able to talk and communicate and share their thoughts and feelings, we are nurturing their critical thinking skills. Because unless they feel empowered to be able to share and voice their opinions, um, I think everything else sort of takes a back seat. The whole motivation to problem, problem solve also takes a back seat. So I think reading is a skill that over the period of a vacation, one, one and a half month, um, if we can utilize to nurture that skill, that can hugely benefit uh, children across ages and I'm going to talk about reading again and uh, uh, some practical things that you can do to nurture the reading skills a little bit later. Um, one more thing with reading is that ensure that you're choosing books and content where you can ask open-ended questions. Don't think about giving content of books which have a moral or where you want a correct answer after the story no in fact think about the story like a child yourself and then discuss characters discuss the emotions discuss the situation um you know have an open dialogue about what would you do if you were this character or you know what would we do if we were in this situation and those are questions that help nurture critical thinking skills because now the child feels empowered to explore the situation that happened and they become a character in that story and I think that's uh, that's hugely powerful. Um, other skill that you nurture is, of course, you can um, nurture the skill of perspective taking, how different people think and how we need to coexist in this world with a variety of perspectives. Um, the character sketching, the idea of how to design a character, how to design a story. Also of self-awareness and awareness of other people around. I think that's a huge one where you can nurture a lot of empathy and understanding 
for uh, different situations in, in children through reading. And the last bit that I talked about the, in the higher order thinking skills and how you can nurture it is project-based learning. Now, I know we do a lot of project-based learning that happens in schools, um, but there is a way to do it in a, in a very fun and engaging manner, even during vacations. So essentially, when we're saying a project, what I'm saying is, can we give a reason for our children to wake up energetically every morning, even during the vacations? Is that possible? Can they get up with a purpose? And when you do that, you already know that you have engaged them into critical thinking, into understanding their own power and potential and impact in their surroundings. So I'll take a small example. What you could do is you could get all the children in the society together. I know this is going to take a little bit of effort as a parent and a little bit of your time, but trust me, it's going to be worth it because when you get everybody together, they're going to take it, take off on their own and they won't need um, you know, your involvement or guidance as much. Um, and I'm sure they can drive it. So for example, if you are looking at five, six graders, seven graders, or uh, of course, if there are older children, then it becomes easier. But get them together and get them to think about any one problem that they are facing in the society or apartments that they live in. It could be um, that the society is dirty. It could be the fact that the playground is not up to the mark or, you know, the, the swings are coming apart. Or it could be the fact that the walls are too dull and we don't feel very nice when we walk into the apartments and let them pick up any one problem and think about solving it. Now, when you give this direction and let the children be, you will be surprised with the kind of responses that they'll come back to you with. They would talk about how to solution, how to get the money. They could do uh, a donation drive from the, from the society. They could set up a lemonade stall and all the proceeds will go towards, for example, painting the wall or any particular project that they've taken up and let them enable them to drive this to completion in that one, one and a half month period. And what you will notice is that they would have felt so impactful and so um, powerful in this entire uh, journey that they would take that feeling to the school when, when they rejoin back in July and they would have something to offer to their peers as well. You are not, I mean, not just nurturing that skill of completing a project, you're, you're nurturing skills of managing finances, of dealing with, uh, you know, different emotional beings because they have to work in a team. They'll be learning economics, they'll be learning planning, time management, you name it. And these are what critical thinking skills are or higher order thinking skills are. This is nothing other than the fact that children are able to make decisions. They are able to come to the point of decision making through a series of inquiry. And that is what we are trying to nurture through these activities. Now, I know a lot of you will think is, you know, that all of this requires so much of our involvement as parents and we already are hard pressed for time and we have to think of what to do with the child now that they're not going to school and we will have to do a daycare arrangement or some other, other arrangement. I'm saying I understand that practicality and it is true that it's not easy to take out extra time. But here I would urge you to pause and think for a moment that with your child, you get about 18 or 19 of these vacations in your lifetime before they actually go away into their colleges and into their spaces wherever they want to go. So do you want to let go of this opportunity without connecting with your child? I don't think so. When you think of it from that perspective, you would want to invest a little bit of time in that vacation to do all of this that I talked about. So now coming to some practical things that you can do during the vacations. First is, and this is the most important, and I know I'm going to be struggling with it along with you, but I'm going to make an effort every single day, is ensure that the children are sleeping and waking up at almost the same time that they sleep and wake up during their uh, normal school days. Why that is important is if a child gets into this habit of getting up late and lazing around through half of the day, 
chances are that they are not going to feel energized to do anything and time is soon going to fly by they will realize that their one month break actually felt like two weeks because half of the time was wasted sleeping and you know just lazing around so it's a bit of a ask but do try to ensure that the sleep and the wake up times are almost uh, consistent with what used to happen during school days <clears throat> the second is ensure that you are making some time to build an emotional connect in this time i know that again i acknowledge the fact that working hours are not going to change even if it is school vacation time but if you can come back and connect with your child over a board game for example a board games most of the good board games will nurture critical thinking skills and will nurture nurture problem solving th skills anyway but it's also a hugely emotionally bonding experience which a child is going to look back after 20 years and remember oh you know we used to play carrom oh we you know we used to play um business and cluedo and what not so invest that time in you yourself and your child to building these memories the second uh, the third bit is uh, if you're going to a vacation uh, and i urge that you must go to vacations either as a family or to extended family visit people so that children are able to see the, the variety of living spaces of types of people and 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 realize that there's a whole world outside their bubble so definitely do travel but ensure that your child is part of the planning of the trip um i know it's probably for younger children it's not so much possible but at least for grade 1 2 and above children can very much participate in building the itinerary for the for the traveling and let them feel empowered and and responsible for the success of the trip so that's my third tip um and the fourth is um, <clears throat> do explore other ideas to keep learning and engaging with studies in a fun way i know that a lot of schools are giving summer homework but there are schools that have said no to summer homework they are leaving it pretty open ended for the parent and the child to connect and ensure that they are doing these kind of project based things to um, nurture subject knowledge as well so do explore ideas to do that and i'm going to show you a couple of ideas so the first one that i talked about was about reading so i'm actually subscribing to an online library for the last two years for my son it's called i love read dot i in i spell it out for you it's i l o v e r e a d dot i in i love read dot in it's an online library so you just go ahead and look at their online uh, selection of books you select it you order it and you get a packet like this at home this is the packet that just arrived today for my son um and they would provide me these books and um when i'm done reading it i can order the next lot and then they come and pick these books up and deliver the new lot so it's hugely convenient for me because i don't have a physical library in my vicinity so i look forward to receiving books from my library and my son and i we just absolutely enjoy bonding over books in the last year i think my 4 year old has read about 150 to 160 books all because of this library so definitely do look into such options this is one of the option but uh, look into options of libraries for your children here i would also like to mention two of my own books that i have written um the first one is actually called let's talk about my feelings um it's a book that i have written to help nurture uh, emotional vocabulary in children to help them understand what they are feeling about themselves and about characters and even write it so it's like a, a picture book with um a place for them to write after the short story it's a it's a rhyming story and they can think about the characters and they can write about it and and relate to the characters and just um you know realize that this could be them this could be somebody in their own uh, vicinity and think about those characters so these are this is one of my book it's called let's talk about my feelings it's available on amazon and my second book is called ramya's bat it's a very sweet book it's a funny story of a, of this girl called ramya who wants to play cricket um but everybody is telling her that no it's a boys game so it's a it's a story on gender stereotyping in sports 
um, do go ahead and grab your copy. This is also on Amazon. And uh, finally, when I was talking about learning, uh, making learning engaging through the through the summer vacations, through tools. So the tool that I would like to talk today about is Manga High. This is the program that I work with. It's a mathematics learning program. It's an adaptive, personalized math learning program for students. And it ensures that every child is learning at his or her own pace, at their level of understanding, and ensuring that they are um, enjoying math on the way. So we have 900 plus math activities and games and lots and lots of math questions. So children from grades 1 to grades 10, so all of your five-year-olds till 15-year-olds can use Manga High. Um, so I highly urge you, if you're a parent, do talk to your school about Manga High and see if they would like to go for a Manga High subscription. Um, you can go to M-A-N-G-A-H-I-G-H, mangahigh.com to get more information about this program. We are based in London and we have uh, worked with about 5,000 schools around the world. So it's a highly, highly revered program and I would highly urge you to at least look into it. Also, uh, a quick fact that we are doing a math challenge uh, this summer, actually a little before the vacation, so April 29th to May 10th. This is a free mathematics challenge for students to participate in. If you would like to introduce your child and your child's school to Manga High, please go ahead and utilize this opportunity and participate in this free math challenge. It's called the South Asia Math Ninja Challenge. And uh, we are inviting about nine countries to participate. So it will be an, uh, an awesome experience, a lot of, lot of trophies and uh, medallions to be won. So I look forward to being a partner with all of you in your learning journey. And I hope you took something away from this, from this chat. If there are any questions, I would love to take them now. Otherwise, all the best. <laughs>